Good evening, everyone. Uh, hope you all are doing well. On behalf of NISM, I, Kiranjit Kaur, welcome you all and take this opportunity to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Prakash Sanjan Sinha, for this webinar on res uh, recent developments in mutual fund space. Uh, brief about Mr. Sinha. Mr. Sinha has 30 years experience in sales, business development, channel management, knowledge management, learning and development in financial services industry, working with renowned financial companies such as UTI Mutual Fund, Chola Mandalam AMC, Bajaj Capital Limited, ITI Financial Services Limited, among others, at various uh, leading roles. Mr. Sinha is also a financial markets trainer who has conducted more than 600 training sessions for approx. 27,500 different trainees spending over 3,000 training hours in the stream of investments in mutual funds, equity research, debt market, retirement planning, fundamental analysis, technical analysis, etc. He has also uh, appeared as a speaker at various invest, uh, investment and mutual fund TV shows on channels such as Z Business TV. Further to his excellence, Mr. Sina has been a visiting faculty or guest speaker on financial and management topics at International School of Financial Planning, Rai Business School, Amity Business School, Asia Pacific Management Institute, NMIMS Mumbai, Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics Mumbai, etc. On the academic front, Mrs. Sina is MSc in Chemistry and MBA from uh, Faculty of Management Studies, Delhi, and possesses a postgraduate diploma in Equity Research and Analysis from the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysis of India, Hyderabad. He is also a fellow member of the Council for Portfolio Management and Research, Hyderabad, and confirmed the designation of Certified Portfolio Manager possessing varied NISM certifications. We heartily welcome you, sir, and over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karanjit, uh, and welcome to each and every participant for this session. So just give me one minute. I'll just make the presentation. So, is it clear to everybody? So, are you able to see the slides? Yes, sir. Yeah, take it. So, uh, we'll start this session and uh, today's session is all about mutual fund. And basically, we'll be talking about what has been the development in mutual fund spaces. And also, talking about some real data. And real data, of course, gives you an idea about the opportunity in the mutual fund space, both as an investor as well as a career. And all of us know that NISM is a pioneer body in this country. They have been running so many certification courses and so many training programs. So you will learn to know that there are so many career opportunities if you do any of these certification courses which are run by NISM. So let's start the session. Now we are going to talk about some of the regulations. There have been so many regulations. Uh, and uh, so we are not going to talk each and every regulation. Maybe in coming webinars, we can talk about some other regulations also. But today we are going to just touch upon four regulations. One is on the benchmarking of mutual fund schemes. Second one is potential risk matrix for debt scheme, which is based on credit risk and interest rate risk. Swing pricing. Now it's a very, very new concept which has come into the mutual fund. And of course, all the distributors who are giving a very, very good service to the industry, they also need to be remunerated. And this remuneration is a very, in a different way, more on, a, I would say, uh, giving them some sentimental advantage, which is in a form of a nomination on trail commission. Now, we have been seeing up till now, for each scheme, there has been one benchmark, which is as per category. For example, let's say, if there is a large cap fund, there is a large cap index. If there is an IT fund, there is an IT cap index. If there is a mid cap fund, there is a mid cap indices. Now let's take an example of a mid cap or a small cap. All of us know that as per MV and SEBI regulation, 101 to 250th stocks as per the full market capitalization are a part of mid cap universe and beyond 251 is the small cap now when you look at any mid cap fund you will find the range is quite large 150 but maybe there are only 40 or 50 
stocks available. Now, there could be two types of funds, both in mid-cap category. Not necessarily both of them will have the same type of stocks. Even if they are having same type of stocks, the weightage could be different. So, when you see two mid-cap funds, maybe one is giving you 15% return and the other one is giving you 21% return. And if you are comparing with the same benchmark, because SEBI has made it mandatory, for each scheme, if you are talking about the performance, it has to be compared with a relevant benchmark. And the benchmark is nothing, but it represents the type of market where the money is exposed to. In other words, we always talk about mutual fund is subject to market risk. So when we talk about the market risk, what is that market? That market itself is represented by the benchmark. So for different schemes, there are different, different benchmarks. But the benchmark is bigger compared to the size of the fund in terms of stocks I'm talking about. Maybe the fund management style strategy also could be different. So now it has been decided in continuation with the continuing category-wise benchmark, which will be there, there has to be an additional benchmark also. So it has been decided that there will be two tiered structure for the benchmarking of the scheme for certain categories of scheme, not all. So the first will be reflective of the category of the scheme, which I already explained to you. And the second category, which has come very recently, would be the benchmark, which will be demonstrative of the investment style strategy of the fund manager within the category. So as I was telling you, one fund is giving you 20% return and the other fund is giving you 15% return. When we are going to compare with the same benchmark, alpha of one will look definitely much better than the other one. But one question we need to ask ourselves, how come one fund has been able to give you 20% return, whereas the other has given only 15% return? That means there must be some difference in the strategy style fund management. Now, when you are going to compare the fund with another benchmark, which will be reflective of the strategy style. So that is going to give the comparison much more relevant. So now we are having two tier benchmark and first one category wise and the second one as per the strategy style. Now all the benchmarks have been uh, on a total return index basis. Total return means that dividend income, all those interest income will be incorporated. So second tier benchmark, as of date, is optional. It's not compulsory or mandatory because it has been just introduced a year back. So it's as of date, it is optional and it has to be decided by the EMC according to their investment style strategy of the index. And as I told you, it is going to help investors to compare the funds much better than earlier times. So as per SEBI regulation, debt funds, income funds, growth equity funds, only they will have a second tier benchmark. All other schemes like hybrid scheme, thematic sector schemes, index fund, ETFs, fund of funds, they are going to have only one benchmark as the category average, what we have been talking about. So the first one is as per the category average and the second one will be as per the strategy and style. Now the second benchmark has to be selected or has to be constructed if it is not available and which should be reflective of the strategy style. For example, let's say in an in a income fund, it could be a bespoke, that means constructed according to the investment strategy style of the index like AAA bond index. Similarly, it could be, let's say in equity, it could be different. So by having two tier benchmark, now the industry is moving towards a situation where the investor as well as the distributor can get a better idea about on the fund management. And based on the strategy style the fund manager has taken in order to give more return or a different return compared to the peer group players, one can get a better idea which fund is doing better or worse amongst the peer group. So this is one very important regulatory change which has happened. Now let's talk of the second regulatory change. This is talking about potential risk matrix for the debt scheme. Now, whenever we talk about debt, debt fund, 
we need to understand one thing. There are only two major risks which impact the debt performance. One is coming from the credit side and the other one is coming from the interest rate side. So when we talk about the credit risk, what could be the credit risk? Maybe there could be default or delay in payment because in a debt fund, the fund manager has further invested in different type of debt securities. It could be common securities, it could be corporate bonds so of different maturity, giving different coupons of different ratings. But each of the debt people have got some credit rating. Now, higher the credit rating, for example, AAA is considered to be safer compared to lower the credit rating like E. Now, money has been invested, but there could be delay in getting the interest or maybe principal as defined in the agreement, or there could be rating downgrading also. So when the, when the investment was done, it maybe it was triple A, but later on it rated by Crystal Ikra Care, it has gone to double A or double A plus. So it could be due to that. So that impacts the price of the debt securities. Many times it can lead to liquidity risk also. It can lead, lead to price risk also. So that is a risk. And when there is a change in, when there is a risk in the price, of course, it is going to impact the net asset value. And from the net asset value only, we calculate the return. So that is one part of the risk. The second part of the risk is coming from the interest rate. Now, all of us know in our economy, RBI comes with a credit and monetary policy every second month. And the objective of the RBI policy is to ensure that the cost of money, which is the interest rate within the economy, is in such a way that it is it counters both the inflation as well, it also supports the growth. Now, but many times maybe inflation is too high, so RBI is left with no other to increase the interest rate. And RBI is having their own target of maintaining the inflation rate between two to six percent. So interest rate can go and up and down. Now, inflation is something which is again decided by the uh, general consumption level. That's why we call it CPI. Infl uh, rate. Inflation is measured on CPI. Now, interest rate can keep on changing. RBI can change the policy rate. Maybe can change the repo rate, reverse repo rate, CRR, SLR, all these rates they can change in order to ensure that whether enough liquidity has to be in the system or they want to suck the liquidity from the system. So RBI, RBI will keep on changing it. Now, based on whatever these things happen. Individual banks and finance companies, NBFCs, they can also change their industry again, but they can change again, looking at the competitive scenario or also looking at their own scenario. But we know that whenever there is a change in interest that could be impact in the bond prices. And it works on the different direction. So generally, if the interest rate increases within the economy, the price of a bond decreases. That means there could be mark to market loss. And whenever the interest rate falls, the price of a bond increases. That means there could be mark to market gain. So in either case, NAV can get impacted as so as well as the return. Now, these are the two risks which I told you. And uh, this impacts the performance of the fund. Now, keeping this thing in mind, now it has been decided that all debt schemes will be classified in terms of potential risk metrics, consisting on the parameters based on maximum interest rate risk, which is allowed. And this is measured as per the Maclos duration and the maximum credit risk allowed, which will be measured as per the credit risk value. So we are going to see in the coming table how it is built. So basically it's a matrix where on one side you're talking about the credit risk value, and on the other side, you're talking about the maculous duration. So horizontally, it is the credit risk value, and on the vertical scale, it's the maculous duration. And there are nine cells. Now, this regulatory change has come. Now, after this regulatory change has come, now each and every scheme 
in the debt side, they have to place their scheme in one of the cell. Maximum permissible credit risk, maximum permissible interest rate risk is defined. So, now whenever such changes can happen, maybe one of the fund is in one cell, maybe it can move to other cell within that matrix, then investors have to be informed through SMS. Also necessary uh, changes will be happening, information will be shared to the website of the AMC. Now let's look at it, how this will be decided. There is a threshold level. Now, maximum weighted average interest rate risk for the scheme, which is measured in terms of MACLIS duration, it will be class one. That means low. That means it is having low interest rate risk. But there the MACLIS duration has to be less than one year. Class two, which is moderate, it will be less than three years, equal to and less than three years MACLIS duration. And class three, which will be relatively high, is any MACLIS duration. Similarly, on the credit risk value, which is going to be a measure of the credit risk, again, it will be the maximum weighted credit risk. Class A, the credit risk value will be greater than 12. That means it is on the lower side. Class B, greater than equal to 10. It is on the moderate side. And then class C is this. It is less than 10. So this is how it will look. So if you look at it, there are nine cells. So let's look at relative low interest rate risk and relative low credit risk. So here you look at it, the credit risk value is greater than or equal to 12. And for the same, the MACLOS duration is less than one year. So it could be anything, relatively low, moderate, or relatively high. Same thing on the interest rate CRV side. Now let's look at an example. For example, let's say there is an open-ended short duration fund who wants to invest in a security such as weighted average backlist duration. When I'm saying weighted average, what do I mean by that? Because in the fund, let's say, there could be debt securities of different maturity, different bond papers having different backlist duration. The proportion of money could be different for different. So when you take the whole, that means the weighted average maximum duration of the bond portfolio, it could be the proportion of that particular debt paper multiplied by the maximum duration of the debt paper. And in the same way, you are going to add on. So you come to a weighted average method. Just like we call, uh, calculate weighted average maturity, same way here, same way, when we talk about the rating side, there could be GSEC, there could be triple A rated bond, there could be double A, single A. Again, the proportion of money will also be varying. So here also you are taking as per the weighted average. So on a weighted average, you are taking it. So let's say if the fund is having on a weighted average, maculous duration between one to three years. And also on a credit risk value, it is between 10 to 12. So this fund will be coming under B2 class. Similarly, maybe somebody will be in a B1, somebody can be in C1, somebody can be in A3. So you can have funds in this way. And as you can see, the maximum allowed interest rate risk and maximum allowed credit risk is well defined. For a scheme placing itself in class one, where the maculous duration is less than one year, the maximum residual maturity of each instrument has to be less than three years. For the scheme placed in class two, 
where the maculus duration is equal to less than three years, the maximum residual maturity for each instrument held in the scheme has to be seven years. So there also it is well defined what is the maximum limit as far as the residual maturity is concerned. So if you look at it, not today, earlier we were having only riskometer. Now when I look at the riskometer, we find that the funds are classified as low, low to moderate, 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 all the things are there. Let's say there are two funds which are classified under low, or maybe let's say low to moderate. But there also, there could be difference. Now, by coming with the potential risk matrix, not only the investors are able to know more about the risk aspect of that fund, but the other thing is the maximum permissible risk is also well defined. That means the fund has to be within that aspect. So this potential risk matrix has to be disclosed, it will be reflecting in the scheme information document. And if there is any shift, within the cell, then it has to be informed to the investor through SMS, through email, updated on the website. And it will also be updated on the monthly basis, which will reflect in the fact sheet, which comes on a monthly basis. It will also be reflecting in the annual report and abridged summary. So this was on the potential risk matrix. Now let's look at some another concept, which is called swing pricing. Now, what is swing pricing? Let's say there is a big amount of money which is coming within the fund as a net investment. Big amount. Now, the fund manager is not under a constraint that he has to invest in one day or two day or three day only. He will invest it when you get the right type of security as per the investment objective of the scheme. But when there is a big redemption, that as per SEBI regulation, the redemption has to be met. And generally what happens? Within one or two days, that redemption proceeds is getting into the bank account of that investor. So when there is a big outflow of money from the fund, that has to be honored under SEBI regulation. When there is a big inflow, at that time, may the impact could not be that much on the net asset value. But when there is a big outflow, there could be an impact. Why? Because our debt funds are liquid in nature. In an open-ended debt fund, anytime anybody can buy units. Anybody can withdraw money also. Even if there is, let's say, there is exit load also, if the investor is willing to pay exit load, he can withdraw. Nobody can stop him. So this is there in an open-ended scheme. But when we look at our debt market, then our debt market is not so liquid. Our debt market is dominated by government securities, mostly. Corporate bond is not so much in our debt market. Our debt market is not so deep and vibrant, unlike our equity market. Most of the investors, big investors, let me put it this way, who are investing in debt are insurance company. Maybe provident fund, PF money. All these big investors are investing, big chunk of money. And most of them might not be actively trading. It's a buy and hold because they are, have got certain time where the money has to be paid. So our debt market is not that liquid. That means there's no constant buying and selling, which is happening. But when you look at the, our debt funds, it is liquid. So what can happen if there is a huge or big outflow that it can, it can impact the net asset value? Because in our debt fund, let's be very clear, debt particularly, the pricing of a debt security is not so difficult. For the very simple reason, each and every debt security, the cash flow pattern is known. For example, let's say 
when the interest income will be coming, how much will be coming? It's known. When the principal will be paid back, what is the maturity? Everything is well defined. Until unless there is a default or some, something happens, maybe call option or something is exercised. That's why you will find the volatility in the debt is much lesser compared to equity. Because in equity, it is more or less dependent upon the fortune of the business as well as economic and market factors. But that's not the case in a debt. But there could be a situation because of a huge outflow, it can impact the price. And many times, all of us know, even the market price of a debt security should be reflecting the cash flows, which is going to get it, and it's on a discounted basis. But still, because there is a selling pressure, the prices can get distorted. Because anything, any market works on a demand and supply. So let's say if the selling pressure is there, then it can bring down the price. And that can affect the net asset value. Now, in order, keeping that all these things in mind, the swing pricing mechanism has come. So what is that? It is a mechanism by which the fund house can adjust the scheme net asset value in response to the outflow from the fund. Because as I told you, huge or big outflow can have an impact. Now the continuing investors who are there in the fund, they should not suffer because somebody else is withdrawing the money. He's, getting his, he's taking his money back. But because of that, let's say, the prices of the securities get affected and they are getting impacted. So in order to protect the continuing investor, this swing pricing has come in. Now this swing pricing framework is valid for open-ended debt scheme, except for overnight, guild fund, and guild fund with 10 years maturity. So as I told you, it will be applicable in a scenario where there is a net outflow from the scheme. Now there are two situations where this swing pricing could be applicable. One is a parcel swing during normal times. So normal times means because of outflow within the fund which is happening, or there could be a mandatory full swing during market dislocation, which can impact the high-risk open-ended scheme. Now, when we talk about market dislocation, it is something which is macro, which is going to impact everybody. But partial swing can impact that particular scheme only. So let's look at what is the swing pricing during normal times and how it will be impacted. Amphi is going to prescribe broad parameters for determining what will be the threshold for triggering swing pricing, which will be followed by the AMCs. So swing pricing is not going to be applicable at all points of time, only maybe when something of a huge outflow is happening. So Amphi is going to prescribe the broad parameter. Amphi shall also prescribe an indicative range of the swing factors, which will be there. Additionally, AMC will be also allowed to have their own parameters if it desired to, considering the nature and characteristics of the mutual fund scheme. Because within the scheme also we know there are the different, different type of schemes. So can impact, it cannot impact the same in all schemes. It can be more in a high-risk fund, maybe lesser in low-risk fund. So the broad guidelines has been laid down. MP is going to take care of all those things. When to be applicable, what are the parameters, what are the factors, all those things. For normal times, AMC shall decide the applicability of the swing pricing and the quantum of swing factor depending upon the scheme-specific issues. And all these things has to be well mentioned in the scheme information document. AMC, if they desire show, implement the swing pricing framework for normal period after incorporating clauses pertaining to the same in their scheme information document. And the same shall be considered as a fundamental attribute change in case it is applicable. Now, what is market dislocation? As I told you, this is something happening at a market, at a macro level. I mean, let me give you an example. Let's say there is something huge in active news, which comes, let's say. And maybe out of panic, everybody starts redeeming. So this can impact the market as a whole. 
maybe something uh, related to stock exchange maybe some technical issue so it is something which is not related to the fund but maybe related to the general macro environment so in that case what happens again financial market will be at a stress and many times when it is a stress the pricing again is not clear because we need to understand whenever we look at the market price whether it's debt or equity ideally it should be the reflective of the future cash flow so in uh, in uh, equity or debt the way it is calculated the intrinsic price it is discounted cash flow what benefit what cash flow is going to come so that is discounted at the present rate of return so generally it should be that but at the same time we also know there are certain economic and market factors also which impact because that can lead to impact on the demand and supply and many times the demand and supply imbalances can also affect the price so yes price what it should be is not reflecting truly in the market at that time because of huge outflow or maybe because of market dislocation so the remaining investors who are there in the fund their interest needs to be protected so for the purpose of determining market dislocation again ampi shall develop a set of guidelines parameters models when to be applicable and they are going to recommend it to the sebi sebi will can its own also determine it so maybe on the based of the ampi recommendation as well as maybe sebi as and when they can feel so as far as application of swing pricing due to during market dislocation it has to be notified by sebi it cannot happen on its own so sebi is going to notify that swing factor because of market dislocation has to be applicable and also for what period they are going to decide so again subsequent to the announcement of market dislocation the swing pricing framework where it will be applicable it is applicable to all open ended debt scheme except overnight and gilford but there are also scheme which has got high or very high risk on the risk meter or which classify themselves in a3 b2 b3 c1 c2 and c3 of the potential risk matrix a minimum swing factor as under shall be made applicable to the scheme and the nav has to be adjusted for the swing factor so let's look at it we have already we know what is risk meter all of you know so high very high so if the scheme is categorized in that then swing factor will be applying applying there and in a case of potential risk matrix these are the cells so if the scheme is falling in any of the cells a3 b2 b3 c1 c2 c3 then in a case of market dislocation swing pricing can so let's look at what is the minimum swing factor for open ended debt scheme during market dislocation so we have already talked about potential risk matrix and again what will be the minimum swing factor so in class b just you look at it let uh, let me go a slide backward so for these cells which i have marked 1.5 for c1 and for b2 it is minimum 1.25 and for c2 it is minimum 1.75 for a3 it is 1% minimum swing factor and for b it is 1.5% and for uh, sorry b2 b3 it is 1.5% and for c3 it is 2% now this is the minimum swing factor which can be applied during market dislocation and as i told you market dislocation that has to be notified by sebi because of some macro issues scheme can levy higher swing factor again depending upon the situation maybe redemption pressure or maybe the portfolio is getting impacted adversely so they can in, even put a higher swing factor but this is the minimum now just to give you an example let's say Let's say there is a ABC scheme. 
the net asset value is 20 rupees. Now, because of, let's say, outflow or maybe market dislocation, swing factor has to be applied. And let's say the swing factor which is going to be applied is 1% of the NAV. So in this case, though the scheme NAV is 20 rupees, the investor who is redeeming will not be redeeming at 20 rupees. Here I'm assuming there is no exit loan. He will not be redeeming at 20 rupees. Normally, which is allowed, but, but just because of swing factor application, because of maybe huge outflow, he will be redeeming at 98. The reason is why, because due to withdrawal of that investment, others investors should not get impacted. So this factor will be decided. And as I told you, it is not something which is fixed. Minimum has been there. If you go, if I go earlier slide, this is the minimum. If the impact is more, maybe the fund is going to work out. Maybe in consultation with Amphi, the broad parameter, everything is there. But if the impact is more, maybe it could be 2% also. But the ultimate objective is that because of withdrawal of one big investor, or huge withdrawal, the remaining investors who are there in the fund, their net asset value should not get impacted. That means the interest of all investors who are continuing in the fund is getting protected. So the investors taking advantage of the limited liquid, uh, fund liquidity can be charged because as I told you, our corporate bond is not so liquid and prices can get distorted because of Ill illiquidity reason or maybe because of uh, even credit events also. So swing pricing, the incentive to be the first mover is diminished. So let's say if anybody is getting out also because of maybe he's visualizing some macro negative things coming, again, that is going to get nullified. He is not going to get that advantage. So it is applicable on all, okay? So we have already talked about it, it will be, uh, communicated in the scheme information documents and whatever is minimum what is allowed should not be considered as a change in fundamental attribute. But if higher than what is minimum is allowed or done, then that will be considered as a change in the fundamental attribute of the scheme. So swing, uh, Pricing framework is triggered and swing factor is made applicable in normal times, market dislocation. Both the incoming and outgoing investors shall get the net asset value adjusted to the swing factor. All AMCs have to make disclosure in the, with illustration in their scheme information document. What swing factor, what minimum swing factor, under what circumstances, maybe there could be increase in the swing factor. All those things, they have to be meeting it on what could be triggered and what will be the impact on the net asset value for incoming and outgoing investors. Swing factor will be made applicable for all redemption, except for those who are redeeming less than two lakh in any of the situation, whether market under normal situation or market dislocation. AMC What has happened? Uh, sir, uh, your voice has got broken and suddenly the PPT is also not appearing. PPT is not appearing? Yes, sir. Yeah, now it is appearing. No, but it was not appearing when? Uh, just now, just for a moment, it got take, stuck. Take it, take it. Yes, sir. 
maybe some technical issue would be yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. Could be. Now yeah. it is audible and visible both. Okay. But earlier, uh, till what uh, slide? Uh, so the same one. Just now it, it got. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Take it. Take it. Chali, thank you. So any any redemption which is happening less than two lakh, of course, uh, swing will uh, impact will not come. Uh, whether it's a normal times or misappropriated dislocation, and all this policy procedure, everything has to be approved by the board of trustee as well as uh, board of AMC. Performance has to be on the unswung NAV. It will not. The swing factor is not going to be considered whenever we are, the fund is going to talk about the performance. So this was all this, and then all disclosure will be there in the SID annual report, a bridge summary on the website. So this was on the swing uh, pricing. Now let's talk of uh, nomination for trail commission. Now all of us know that uh, when we talk about investor, there also we have got this provision can he can nominee, he can make nominee, and they will get the amount after his death. Now, distributors have been working very, very hard last five years, 10 years, 20 years, and they have accumulated maybe 10 crore, 20 crore, 100 crore. Now, suddenly, let's say, if something unfortunate happens to that MFD distributor, all his effort, which he has put in last 10 years, 20 years, should not get Go waste and the benefit has to go to his family members that dependent. Now, in order to protect the interest of family members, now there is a drive that each and every distributor should have, first of all, nominee. And that nominee is entitled for the trail commission in case there is an unfortunate death of the distributor. Now, the nominee need not be the ARN holder. Even if he's not an ARN holder, he will continue to get the trail commission till the business remains in the name of the deceased ARN holder. But of course, once somebody has expired, no new business can be done in that name. Only whatever was recorded as of that day till his death, will continue to be entitled for the trail commission. So, but one thing is also equally important that the ARN should be valid on the death of the MFD. So it should not be that when the MFD has expired on that day, the ARN is not valid. So again, it's a responsibility of the each and every distributor to ensure okay, this ARN is timely validated. They pass this NISM 5A examination or they attend CPE program. They should not maintain the gap. Also, if that ARN code is under suspension, maybe at that point of time, then again, then it will not be considered. So normally shall receive the commission only as a trustee for the legal heir of the disease. Now let's say later on, if the nominee wants to become a MFD himself, then he has to again pass the examination, it has to do his KYD, get ARN number, get empaneled with AMC. So all those processes are there. So when he takes this ARN number, then with the approval of the client who was earlier in the code of deceased MFD, he can move that business. But again, with the approval of that. So again, this is for benefiting the distributor's family. In case there is a sudden or unfortunate death, then the family should not be suffering. So this is again a very, very good measure taken by the industry to protect the interest of the distributor, their family, in case of a certain or unfortunate. But this is not applicable on the overseas distributor. Now, these are some of the regulatory changes which we have talked, which is all good for the betterment of the investor as well as for the distributor. Now, NISM is having some of the certification course, 5A for the distributor, 
as well as 5B for the MFD foundation certificate examination. So 5A is for those people who are linked with AMC, uh, broking company, distribution company, yeah, independent individuals who are engaged in the distribution of mutual fund product. So this is come, exam is a computer-based multiple choice. Test duration is four, two hours. There is no negative marks. The passing mark is 50. Very easy. Certificate is valid for three years. That means after, third year, after three years, again, the person has to get the certification. And the fees to be paid is 1,500 rupees. Total marks, total questions are 100 of one marks each. So who should take this examination? So as I told you, those people who are interested in doing distribution business in a mutual fund. What they are going to learn? They are going to learn about the basic of mutual fund rules, structures, what are different type of products, how net asset value is calculated, how return is calculated, what are the different risks, how the financial planning is to be done, and how mutual fund product is going to help in attainment of the financial goal of the investors. How to recommend the product? What factors to look into it? How to compare the funds? So all these things in detail it is given. And this is going to help anybody who wants to sell mutual fund, who wants to become MFD, and he will, be, he will have a complete knowledge about the subject, both from the theoretical aspect as well as from the practical aspect. Now, there is another one, which is NISM Series 5B. And this is for those people, maybe who are retired government and semi-government official, postal agents, so they can also clear this examination and they can sell the mutual fund product. Same, multiple choice, two hours, no negative marks, passing mark is 50, certificate is valid for three years. The fees here is less, 1200. And number of questions asked is 50 questions. So there it was 100 questions, it is 50 questions. So you are having lesser number of questions and more time. So who can take this examination? Postal agents, retired government and semi-government officials, retired teachers. So this exam is a bit easier, I would say, compared to the 5B exam. So same thing, what you are going to learn, what are the basics, how they are structured, what are the features, how it is to be distributed, what are the rules, regulations, how it is going to help you in the financial planning of an investor. Now, having said this, many of you might be thinking whether it is worth doing all this course or just because it's a webinar which is being presented by NSM, they are talking about these products. I would say 100% worth. Why? Now just look at the data. These are facts. The industry AUM was 7 lakh crore just 10 years back. It is it was 36 lakh crore, 36.58 lakh crore. And by June 2023, it is 45 lakh crore. In other words, more and more money is coming. Not only more and more money is coming, the value of investment, the investment is value is also growing. So somebody, whatever he has invested, that has also appreciated. And this, if you look at category-wise, almost all the schemes have grown. Equity, in particular, the 10-year CAGR has been 23.05. And all of us know that equity is the best asset, growth asset, but equity has also got a lot of risk. And the only way the risk can be managed if the money is rooted 
through a professional way or managed in a professional way, which is what is a mutual fund. And you can look at it. Now let's look at the folio growth. And there also, if you can look at it, for 4.28 crore, today it is 11 crore. And by the time we are talking, it might be somewhere about 15 crore. So there also, if you look at it, year to year growth, CAGR, 10 year CAGR has been 10%, almost 9.94. Again, if you look at it, almost all categories has increased. Now let's look at the growth, potential growth of the mutual fund industry. We have already talked about that data. So today it's somewhere about 45 lakh crore. The share of the mutual fund in the overall financial market in India has increased from 10% to 12%, 14% by March 2018. Today it might be much more than that. And if you look at simultaneously, there is a dip in the bank deposit. The growth of the mutual fund industry has been stupendous across the world. But if you look at it, the share of Indian mutual fund industry in the global mutual fund industry, it is very, very low. Very, very low. Maybe this is about or near about maybe 1%. It could be. Now, if somebody asks me, what are the prospects going ahead? Now, all of us are saying that India is the fastest growing economy. India is expected to be the third largest economy after US and China. May, we are going to become a $5 trillion economy. We are all talking about all those things. If I look at the IMF report, World Bank report, everybody is saying positive about India. But when everybody is talking about all these things, GDP and all other things, from where this growth will come ultimately? This growth will come from where? And one of the things from where the growth is going to come is capital market. And within capital market also, the growth engine or the driver has to be the mutual fund industry. And today, if you look at it, today we are living in an internet age. So the younger generation, young people who are getting good salary, getting into, they are risk takers. They are not risk averse like maybe two, three decades back. When I started my career way back in 1989 with mutual fund industry, very difficult at that time to convince people to invest in mutual fund because they were very comfortable with back FD. But today that's not the situation. People on their own are coming and they want to invest in mutual fund. And we have already seen the data. Now let's look at it, uh, the folio. As of June 22, it is what? 13.47. The PAN card holders today are 51 crore. I mean, the Aadhaar card is 43.34 crore. So if you look at it again, there is a huge potential for growth of this industry. If I, if I look at it, the AUM of the industry, which I've already told you, it's just AUM as a GDP is 15.92. But if you look at some of the developed countries, like America or others, it's almost 80, 85%. And as we are growing in economic, GDP is growing, our capital market is growing. The main driver of growth in future is going to be the mutual fund, the capital market. And for the very simple reason, I'll tell you, because on one side, yes, we have got a great potential of growth. On the other side, risk is something which is not easily understood by each and every person, or most of the people, I would say. Because there are a lot of risks coming from almost every quarter, every side. So if there are a lot of risks, the best way to manage your money or to grow your money or you to safeguard your monetary interest as far as investment goes is always rooting your money through a professional route, which is mutual fund. So I would say it's a big, big opportunity for the mutual fund distributors. So I would say for all young aspirants or anybody, because from the data itself, we are seeing Already last 10 years, there has been a big growth. And if I look at the our share of the uh, world industry, which is hardly very less, 
even if it grows to let's say two percent, the AUM is going to just double. And now with so many, I think, of, uh, 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 regulatory changes where the interest of investors are protected, now it is going to give, bring more confidence in the minds of investors. That's debt, equity, or any product. Even the interest of distributors are protected because their dependents will continue to get real income due to, due to nomination facility. So there are some other courses also along with this we will talk about. So maybe on the product sales, you have got currency derivative, interest rate derivative, equity derivative, all type of derivative products are there. On the mutual fund PMS, alternate investment vehicle, distributors, the two examples I have already told you. So they are also PMS distributor, portfolio manager, all those things are there on advisory, investment advisor, level one, level two, the search analyst. On the operation side, RTA corporate, RTA mutual fund. So if you look at it, there are many financial courses for different, different segment of people who want to build their career, they can go for it. So there are a lot of, uh, if somebody can go to the NISM website, nism.ac.in, you can get a detailed information of all these courses and uh, you can choose any one, wherever you feel you have got a good career. So with this, I would like to end up. I thank all of you for being. If there is any question, uh, I would like, love to take it or maybe you can put it on a chat box. Maybe I can. Yes. Uh, sir, Kiran, to this side. Yeah, Kiran. Yes, sir. So uh, we have a few questions, uh, so which I will read out for you one yeah. by one. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, which factors shall be taken care of while investing using mutual funds? Which factor? Now, let me tell you, I, I will answer it very simply. I will not go theoretical. Yes, sir. Investor is investing his money. And one thing he doesn't want is loss. So safety is definitely one. Thing. The second thing is he's investing for some purpose. That means whenever he wants that money, he can sell it, which is liquidity. And the third thing is, of course, growth. Now, many a times between safety and growth, there is a contradiction. But what I want more is important. Definitely, I don't want to lose money. That's the safety. So if I want money in short term, then Debt fund becomes the obvious choice. If I want fund in the mid term, and I'm giving you time also, let's say anything between zero to three years, then debt funds. Anything between three to seven years, let's say hybrid fund. Anything beyond seven years, it could be equity. Okay? So whenever we are looking at the factors, the first thing is what type of funds I'm going to select. And that selection has to be based on my requirement. And definitely, I don't want loss. Within debt fund also, you have got different, different type of funds based on the Macaulay's duration. Let's say, for example, if I want to invest for seven months, then I've got two funds to choose from. Ultra short duration, where the Macaulay's duration is between three to six months, or maybe low duration, three to uh, six months to 12 months. But I should not be going for mid to long duration fund. Is it clear? So the choice of product has to be as per my investment objective and how I am going to know, I have to read the investment objective of the scheme. That means I have to match my objective with the investment objective of the scheme, which is very clearly written in very simple words. Clear? Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, another question we have is, uh, does swing pricing applicable only for debt mutual funds? Yes, it's only for debt. Okay, sir. So another question we have is, how do we get benefit of economies of scale uh, when investing using mutual funds? Economies of scale. I'll answer it very simple. Uh, let's say if I am buying a stock directly, having a broking account. Of course, I have to pay demat charges and broking charges, whatever is there. But whenever the same transaction is happening, 
it's not a small amount. It's a big amount. So in a mutual fund, the economies of scale means large number of investors have invested. In thousands, maybe 10,000, 20,000. Large amount of money has been mobilized, maybe 5,000 crore, 10,000 crore. And large number of securities have been purchased. Now what happens? We all know there is a concept of wholesale versus retail. So whenever you buy something or whenever you execute something in wholesale, the cost, average cost is definitely less. So what happens here, the average cost is less compared to what a retail would be doing. Now, when the cost is going to be less, which is a part of expense ratio, then lesser the cost, lesser the expense ratio, it is adding to the profitability to the fund. That means it is helping on the NAV side, on the growth. So economies of scale definitely is going to help my NAV to be more. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so with this, uh, we would like to conclude our session. Uh, so thank you for enlightening our audience about the recent regulatory developments in which have happened in the mutual fund space. You have widely covered uh, the topic of swing pricing and potential risk class metrics. And you've also informed our candidates about uh, uh, two important uh, NISM certification that, that is series 5A and 5B, that is mutual fund distributors and mutual fund foundation. Uh, you have also above, uh, informed, uh, you know, the potential growth of the mutual fund industry over in in general. By, uh, and how? Why do we sh we shall invest in, in in the industry and why it is important? So that that we are very nicely covered, sir. Thank you so much for that. And so we uh, now we also thank our audience for joining us for this webinar. And uh, we would request that in case you have any query pertaining to any NISM certification examination, you can please log on to our website that is www.nism.ac.in. You may also uh, call us at 8080806476 for any query. Thank you all. Good evening. Yeah, thanks to all the participants. And uh, uh, as uh, said by Karanji, uh, please go to the website of the NISM. And you will find many, many more uh, information, which you will find very advantageous for your own personal investment, as well as for your career within the financial services industry. Thanks to all of you.